The East Lancashire Railway has been running steam trains up the Irwell Valley from Bury since 1987. But the railway first came to the valley in 1846. And more than anything else, it was responsible for the creation of that typical 19th century Lancashire mill town with a name to amuse everyone who heard it. The visitors on this train may not realise it, but they are the modern equivalent of an old trend. Incomers, new arrivals like these, created an industrial village here in the late 1700s from nothing. And many Ramsotten people can trace their ancestors back to incomers of the early 1800s and before. Present day visitors, impressions of the town are probably of Santa Specials or Thomas the Tank Engine Weekends. <laughs> but today I want to find the past that lies behind Ramsbottom's present image. So I've asked local historian Andrew Todd to help me uncover the origins of the town as a village of the Industrial Revolution. So how old is Ramsotham, Andrew? It's got an old feel to it, hasn't it, Les? But before 1783 there was nothing here. Just a farm where the church is and uh, a country lane running past it. The rest was fields. That part of Bridge Street was known as Water Street until the mid 1800s. Quite appropriate for the lane that ran through Ramsbottom because it was water that attracted the town's founding families, the Peel and Yates, the Ashtons and the Grants. And these were not local families? No, they were from Blackburn, Middleton and Scotland respectively and they had to bring their own workers in because there was no one here. These shops have a Hovis advert look about them. Do they date back that far? Uh, they go back to the 1840s and 1850s. Originally, they were workers' cottages, uh, Dungeon Row named after the village lockup, which was just at the back there. So is this part of the original industrial village of 1783? No, it's what we might call a 19th century new town.
which grew up along Bolton Street and Bridge Street from the 1820s onwards. A new town in the 1820s? Well, it wasn't quite Milton Keynes, but it was new build uh, and on a greenfield site. It obliterated the industrial village. There's very little left of that. Just a few ghostly traces amongst the modern streets. So this is Marketplace. Yes, and that's because until well within living memory, this was where the town's market was held. And this is the Grant Arms, Ramsottom's most famous building. Yes, built around 1780 as the local big house first known as Top of the Brow because it stood at the head of the lane. But from 1806 it was the home to Ramsbottom's most famous family, the Grants, and they renamed it Grant Lodge. They moved, it was licensed in 1828, and uh, this frontage was added shortly afterwards. The clock would then have been the main means by which local people read the time. It carries the initials W, G and B. William Grant and Brothers, and it was lit by gas. So their house was this bit at the back, perhaps better appreciated from round the side. Yes, and their flower garden occupied what is now Market Place. And they're often known as the Cheerable Grants. Yes, the Grants are Ramsbottom's best known incomers because of their associations with the novel Nicholas Nickleby. Charles Dickens met two of the Grant brothers in Manchester in the 1830s and modelled his philanthropic Cheerable brothers on them. The Grants were a classic rags to riches story of the Industrial Revolution, weren't they? Yes, William Grant, father of the Cheerable brothers, was a tenant farmer and drover born in 1733 near the Scottish Highland town of Craigellachie, Speyside. Uh, look Les, would you take over the commentary and I'll move round Roundsbottom a bit and, and tell the story. Okay. Well I know that life in Northern Scotland was never easy and it may have become harder in the decades after the defeat of the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion. By 1783, storms, flood and famine persuaded William Grant to chance a move south. Perhaps he'd seen firsthand the money to be made from the rapidly developing textile trades around Manchester. He may have driven cattle this far south before. The contrast with living standards back home couldn't have been greater. William Grant and his family, with horse, cart and cattle, came into Lancashire via Skipton and came down the then old road along here towards Bury. And from this hill, top of the hoof, they first saw what was to be the site of modern Ramsbottom. Writing as an old man 56 years later, William's eldest son, also William, who was to be the elder of the Cheerable Brothers, described how they had halted near this spot. As we passed along the old road, we stopped for a short time on the park estate to view the valley. My father ex exclaimed, What a beautiful valley! It reminds me of Speyside, but the herbal is not so large as the river Spey. By 1828, 45 years later, the Grant brothers were the equivalent of multimillionaires and could afford to buy this land. We erected a monument to commemorate my father's first visit to this valley and on the very spot where he and I stood admiring the beautiful scenery below there is a fine view from the top of the tower in a clear day and the Welsh mountains can be described in the distance. 
Grant Tower became a favourite summer venue for local people. It cost tuppence to climb the spiral stairs for the view from the top. Older people remember with affection the swings and pop, sweets and ice cream that were on sale. Long neglected, the tower finally collapsed in 1944 and slid down the hillside amidst huge clouds of dust. All that remains are these ruins. The Grant's view in 1783 from top of the hoof would have taken in an almost exclusively rural view. There was an old corn mill down by the Irwell, Caldo Mill, where TNT is now, and just two farms. Little had changed since 1324 when the name Ramsbottom was first written in any known document. The Rams bit may reflect how sheep were the main farming product. Bottom could refer to the valley bottom or to the huts or booths in which herders lived. There's a shipper bottom farm just over there, valley bottom where the sheep are kept. Maybe rams comes from the old English ramsar and refers to the wild garlic or ramson plant and it's certainly common in the valley here. My money's on the sheep option and certainly if you went to Manchester Victoria station in the old days and asked for a single to tup's ass they knew exactly where you were going. The landscape may have looked rural in 1783, but it supported a busy textile trade based originally on sheep. The human population lived on the valley sides, away from the dampness of the river floodplain. Farmers survived the winter months by the centuries-old cottage industry of making woolen cloth. There were already textile mills in the valley when the Grants first stood on top of the hoof. These mills had come to help the farmer weavers with the finishing processes which couldn't be performed in a cottage. Fulling stocks like these at Helmshore Textile Museum pounded the woolen cloth so that the fibres felted together and became harder wearing. Water power was the crucial factor which had brought fulling mills, like the higher mill, to the Ramsbottom area. A weir would be constructed to divert water from the river along a goit to the mill reservoir or lodge. Here it would be lodged to maintain a reserve of power, just like a battery stores electrical power. Strongly flowing streams tumbled down through the rocky cloughs and valleys created in the West Pennines by the Ice Age glaciers. The steeper the valley, the greater the fall of water, and the bigger the water wheels could be. The remains of these early mills can be found at many waterside sites in the Rosendale area, as here in the remote Cheesden Valley, an elephant's graveyard of early textile history. Less than three miles to the west is another less well-known elephant's graveyard of early mills. And it's here that Ramsbottom's story really begins, high up in the cloughs above the Irwell. A fulling mill had existed here at Top Wood since at least 1710. By the time the Grants first looked across the Irwell Valley in 1783, a series of inventions was fast making cotton cloth, not woolen cloth, the specialist product of the area. The first had been the flying shuttle. This accelerated the hand loom weaving process. The weaver no longer had to pass the shuttle manually from one side of the loom to the other. And it was here at Park Farm, just yards from top of the hoof, that the inventor of the flying shuttle, John Kay, was born in 1704. One advantage of cotton cloth is that coloured dyes can be printed onto it using wood blocks. Patterns last the lifetime of the cloth if chemically fixed. These skills came from the Far East, an important centre being Calicut on the Malabar coast of India. This is where we get our word for cotton cloth, Calico. 
Calico printing and dyeing required water power and lots of pure water. Early plans show countless streams running across the site of modern Ramsbottom. These are now in culverts, but every so often they burst out to surprise some unsuspecting borough engineer. An extra attraction to calico printers may have been the dye-fixing qualities of the Holcomb Hill iron, which to this day turns many of its streams orange. The cotton trade in the Irwell Valley was dominated in the late 18th century by the Blackburn partnership of Peel and Yates. Robert Peel and various partners had about ten spinning mills around the Irwell, including three here at Somerset. The thread was put out to thousands of handloom weavers who worked in their own cottages in Darwin, Padiham, Bacup, Burnley and beyond. The woven calico then went to crofts or grounds where crofters pegged it out for bleaching in the sun's rays. Next, the calico went to Peel and Yates' three print works for the final finishing process of block printing. As the cotton trade expanded and the market for printed cloth developed, Peel and Yates needed more printing capacity. By sheer coincidence, as young William Grant and his father looked down into the valley, that day in 1783, they were to witness the birth of modern Ramsbottom. As young William was to write in 1839, I recollect that Messrs Peel and Gates were then laying the foundations of their print works at Ramsbottom. Neither of the two Williams could have known that 25 years after they saw this print works under construction, they themselves would buy up the whole operation, together with much of the land that makes up modern Ramsbottom. Remote valleys with good falls of water were sparsely populated, so the early mill owners had to bring in workers. Yorkshire men worked the woolen mills at Topwood, whilst the grants attracted a lot of Scots to Ramsbottom. One source of cheap and tractable labour were pauper apprentices brought by the cartload from city workhouses. About 1795, Peel and Yates built Long Row Somerset to house such child workers, according to local tradition, and rate books show that the Ashtons and the Grants each had apprentice houses in Ramsbottom and Nuttall. Many Ramsbottom residents can trace their descent from these pauper apprentices. One of the most famous was James Bassett, the town's last bellman and town crier, with a voice reputedly audible on Holcombe Moor, some 500 feet above the marketplace. He would hawk cockles and mussels between shouting news or crying a lost child. He was one of the first pauper apprentices to be carted up to work in Ashton's Mill. Reputedly, his name was derived from Bassett Street in London, where he was found. At the other end of the social scale, Robert Peel's industrial fortune brought him political influence. His son, also Robert, born at Chamber Hall, Bury in 1788, became a Tory Prime Minister. Nationally, he is remembered as the Home Secretary who founded the London Police Force the Peelers. Locally, he is known as the Prime Minister who sacrificed party interest to repeal the Corn Laws, bringing down the price of bread in the hungry forties of the 19th century. His death in 1850 was commemorated by the erection of a statue in his hometown of Bury, and this massive monument on Holcomb Hill. Peel Tower dominates the local skyline. It has attracted lots of visitors ever since, especially on Good Friday. Robert Peel Sr. and partners were the true founders of Ramsbottom. Their calico print works in Ramsbottom is called the Old Ground. And its gates were here. It was one of the largest in Britain at the time, but it's as if 
A tide has washed away all traces. The old ground is one of Ramsbottom's best kept secrets, unknown to most of the modern inhabitants. Its appearance will always be a mystery, for there are no photographs and no known surviving contemporary sketches. It was demolished in the 1820s, the site being used for gradual redevelopment as the present town centre. There are a few tantalising hints of its existence. And here we're on Calendar Street, not named after the Scottish town, as I thought when I first moved to Ramsbottom. The health centre stands on the site of the calendar yard, where a large water wheel powered the calendars or cylinders used for roller printing the calico. Two old ground buildings are known to survive. Scotland Place was originally a dry house in which cloth was dried, probably by steam pipes. It's now a terrace of four cottages, originally called Scotch Row, because four Scots families lived here. The other survival is this building on Silver Street. It may have housed skilled workers or perhaps the old grounds works manager. Because of these survivals we have some idea of the traditional building styles that would have been used when the works were erected. We also have details of the old ground from three other sources. This very detailed rating survey made of the township at the time, a plan of 1806 on which this map is based, and the Reverend William Hume Elliot, minister at St Andrew's Presbyterian Church from 1874. He published a local history in 1893 and included descriptions of the town's early appearance from elderly residents. One of his informants was Mrs Elizabeth Wilson, who had been in service with the Grants at Grant Lodge 70 odd years before. Let her describe the old ground. The Bridge Street of today was then mainly the bed of a brook, and at first, very appropriately, it was called Water Street. There were stepping stones across from the works on the old ground side to a row of old cottages which occupied part of the north side of the brook above where the primitive Methodist chapel was afterwards built. The stepping stones were about opposite the present post office or the Royal Oak. The old ground was built for the block printing technology of the 18th century and could not easily accommodate the newly introduced roller printing. Here's William Hume Elliot. The growing prosperity that had attended the efforts of the Grants led them, about 1820, to resolve upon the erection of a calico printing establishment of such magnitude as would enable them to concentrate their varied operations within a single area. The square was the result. It was built in 1821-22. to 22. The external measurement of each of its four sides is 241 feet and it is three storeys high. One contemporary expert on calico printing reckoned that the square would be the largest and most convenient works of any in Europe. This was an unsettled period in social and industrial history Entrepreneurs like the Grants, who invested in the latest technology, were fearful of industrial spies and machine breakers. It is no coincidence that the square was built like a fortress and surrounded on all sides by an eight foot deep moat. Square Mill is long gone, with very little to remind us of its existence, except the name of the street that led to it from the town centre. Once Square Mill was opened, the old ground could be abandoned. The buildings were taken down piecemeal, creating what we would now call a prime brownfield site. On it, the present Ramsbottom Town Centre began to take shape. You may not believe it, 
but these buildings were, in their day, the heart of one of Britain's very early new towns. Bit by bit, new houses and shops were built along Bridge Street and Bolton Street. Numbers 2 to 6, about 1827. Number 8, 1833. Number 10, 1839. That's why the roof line is so uneven. You can see the ribbon development moving its way up Bolton Street. By the 1860s, small-scale capitalists were investing in the construction of complete terraces like these. And this terrace, called Band Row, because the local brass band practiced here, was built around 1867. But we're getting ahead of our story. To understand the development of Ramsbottom's housing, we really need to follow its oldest road. Today, Bolton Street is unspeakably busy. It's the main route in from Bury and Bolton, and it takes time and patience to cross. Modern Ramsbottom hugs the main Bolton to Edenfield Road, which was built as a turnpike about 200 years ago. But before that... There was no Bolton Street then, just a rough track meandering up to Nuttall Lane. According to Hume Elliot, writing in 1893, this short stretch was all that was left of it then. And here it is, left quietly to itself by the modern Bolton Street, on the other side of that retaining wall. If you were travelling into Ramsbottom from the south, whether on horseback or in a cart, you'd use the old road. Let's have a look. The oldest roads kept to dry ground as much as they could, and this meant they were high roads. The old road from Bury crossed the modern A676, what we now call Holcomb Brook. And then climbed the side of Holcomb Hill, just above the modern Lumcar Road. This stretch is still known as Holcomb Old Road, because it leads to Holcomb. This was the most important village in the area, with the only church for miles around and the only pub. In fact, it was so important that there were two. This is the White Hart, an inn on the old road until 1884. The manorial court met twice a year here in a courthouse built in 1664. It doubled up as the local school. When the building became surplus to requirements, it was moved by horse and cart in bits and re-erected down the hill. Old roads in the Pennines often rake up steep inclines. This explains why we call this one in four hill the rake. It took the old Berry Ramsottom Road down from Holcomb. Old roads have often been so heavily used over the centuries that they literally sink into the landscape and become hollow ways like this. The old road wound its way down the steep hillside to Carr and this is where modern Ramsottom began. It's no coincidence that two of the town's first pubs were here. This is the earliest, the Rose and Crown. It was certainly slaking local thirst in 1818, ten years before the Grand Arms opened for business. The Rising Sun is less well known. Like many beer houses, it suffered from government restrictions on the consumption of alcohol during the First World War, and this is probably why it closed. The earliest industrial population was up here, because this is where Ramsbottom's first mills were. Remember the clocks coming down from Holcomb Moor? Ramsbottom's first mill workers probably lived here. Like most Lancashire folds, Carfold grew around a farmhouse. Lancashire's farmer weavers needed their spinners on site. As spinning moved to factories in the late 18th century, 
These fold cottages were available for the new workforce. Car Fold was demolished in the 1930s and very little remains. But what was it like to live in an 18th century workers cottage? Fred Hansen is one of the few people who can remember living here in Car Fold. Can you show us around Fred? Certainly. Uh, the, the cottages were here. There was approximately seven cottages on that side and there was uh, six on this side and the first one was here and that was Hardman's. Right. And uh, Hardman's and they did all the gas, no water and... Uh, no electric? No electric. No. And the, uh, what's it, she, she was a widow and she had two lads as lodged there as had motorbikes. So which was your house then? Our house was the fourth one up from right. the entrance Just to Carrefour. Over here? Just over here. Yeah. And after Harbans, there was uh, Leeches, who was called Nailham because he was very close. <laughs> you mean he was a bit tight? A bit rather, rather tight, uh, tighter than that. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, the uh, walls, etc., were usually whitewashed. And next to Brooks's... What made them rich? What, what, why would well, you say because they, they were was rich? both working. Oh, right. And yeah. there was a big depression from uh, yeah. 1918 to 34 or 5, yeah. Yeah. you see? And the after population was unemployed. Just the one room downstairs? The one, that's the only room there was downstairs. Yeah. The upstairs was a f up a few rickety stairs, and it was one big room which covered both the kitchen and the living room downstairs. It's about six. Ah, and in it there was there was a big beam, yeah. a, a foot, a foot square, went straight across uh -huh. the house from the top of the stairs. It, it must have held the old rope. <laughs> and and the thing with it was, we got we got one two. We got six beds in, in it. By four o'clock in the morning in summer, they used to start crowing. And they crowed then approximately every five minutes. And this carried on until about half past five. And by the time any of us was five, we could crow like a cock. <laughs> and <coughs> these are the footings here, the, these, these walls. Ah, these. Ah, these the, are the foundations of the original buildings, presumably. That's right? correct, ah. And this here is probably the line of front wall. That's the front wall, yeah. And and, where was and, the shop, did you say? And the shop was here. Right. Straight face in there. This is round about where this tree is? Ah, right there, back of that tree. Right. And uh, that was uh, the end wall, and it went straight along here, the front wall. Yeah. And you follow it through. Right. It leads down to where we used to live. Right. And the house in uh, the other two houses. So whereabouts was your house then, Fred? Our house was uh, Jim Leach's here, yeah. and then there was a, sh a bit of a shed in between, and yeah. then there was Brooks's, right. and then yeah. ours was next to that. So down there in that thing? Down there. there, yeah, and then there was just one more on that end. Yeah. That was uh, Mills's. So right. what was your house like, Fred? Well, you went through the front door, and there was a drop latch, no locks. The drop latch, which you lifted the door, which was on hinges, which you dropped the door on, and you lifted the front door, and it lifted off the la off the hook, and then dropped it down, and you was in. The floor was dirt. The dirt floor. And, and we covered it with uh, bits of lino, if we had them, yeah. and coconut matting. Coconut matting. And uh, there was a, a large fireplace with a boiler on one side and an oven on the other. Yeah and a uh, big fireplace in the middle and uh, there was a fender which you used to put your bread on to rise when you baked. Oh yeah. And uh, that was beautiful stuff. Many of the inhabitants of Car Fold worked at Car Mill. It was built in the 1780s and relied on the streams which flowed down the moorside to fill Devil Hole Lodge. Water power was unreliable in the summer and mill owners installed auxiliary steam engines to keep their machinery at work when rainfall failed. After 1783, when Peel and Yates started the old ground, the housing stock in the folds and farms around Ramsottom became quite inadequate. 
Peel and Yates bought Carr Mill in 1788. Here's the mill as seen from Peel Street, a row of housing put up for their workers. There was an explosion of cottage building in what is now the centre of Ramsbottom. By 1795, there were nearly a hundred houses on the farmland of the higher Ramsbottom estate. And according to the survey of that year, there were more houses in building. These rudimentary cottages were often in back-to-back -back terraced rows. Higher new rows were probably the terraces that stood here. Like Carfold, anything that survived from this very first stage of building had been cleared by the 1930s. But let's carry on along the old road. Before this building began, all this was open country. And over there was a big spur of land called Car Bank. You can see how much digging had to be done to take the modern road through it. The old road just went round Car Bank. By carrying on down what is now Bridge Street to Lower Ramsbottom Farm, the farmhouse on the site of which St Paul's Church Tower was later built. There was a rookery there known as the Crow Trees, which is why the farm was called Crow Trees Farm. And why this stretch of the old road and this late 19th century side street got their names. But the line of Crow Lane today is not as it was. The first map we have of the Ramsottom area shows the old Berry Edenfield Road coming down what is now Carr Street, swinging to the left past Crow Trees Farm and heading due north towards what is now Stubbins Village. Not what the road does today, so what happened? Well, newcomers again. In a nutshell, they flooded part of Crow Lane. Samuel and Thomas Ashton from Middleton built a state-of-the-art mill here in 1802 and they needed lots of water so they bought up part of the old road and built a lodge nearly as big as the existing village right here where those trees are you can still see the lodge bank near Ramsbottom swimming baths The Ashton brothers were certainly as important as the grants to the growth of Ramsbottom. They were here a few years before. They built from scratch. And they thought big. Within a few years of them opening the mill, they had a substantial dam or weir here in the Irwell at Stubbins, nearly a mile to the north. Those stumps are the remains of it. Further up river, the greater the fall when the water reached the mill so the bigger the wheels could be. Their goit, or head race, ran alongside what is now Cuba Industrial Estate. This was open country then. It ran alongside Stubbins Lane here, and at this point opened out into a great lodge that continued about a quarter of a mile down to Ramsbottom Mill. In 1992, these blocks of old people's flats were built. The Ramsbottom Heritage Society suggested that they should be known as Ashton Lodge. A double meaning to commemorate the large man-made lake which stood here. With this much water, the mill's water wheels could be big. The one at Helm Shore was 18 feet in diameter and 9 feet wide. The Ashtons at Ramsbottom Mill had three of these giants, each one nearly as big. Once it had turned these wheels, the water re-entered the Irwell about here, next to Peel Bridge. The 1802 mill was soon expanded by 1833, the Ashtons had 900 power looms and numerous spinning machines driven by the water wheels and three steam engines, 
182 horsepower in total. Of the 75 or so mills and factories in the Irwell Valley, none could rival Ramsotton Mill in size or output. Unfortunately, there's little left of the mill, apart from this weaving shed, a small building and some wall. But we can see how big the complex was from the 1842 tithe map. Here's Ramsbottom Mills chimney at the end of Crow Lane around 1910. We have no photographs of the mill and none of the lodge. But we do have this illustration that Hume Elliot found back in 1893. It's the earliest known representation of Ramsbottom. Notice Peel Bridge, Grant Lodge, now the Grant Arms, Ramsbottom Mill, and in front of it what we believe was the Ashton's Apprentice House. Like Peel and Yates two decades before, the Ashtons brought in uh, pauper children. This is where they were housed, in the factory yard. But the 1833 Factory Act made the employment of pauper apprentices less economic and the apprentice house was split up to form these cottages. There are several original features including this interior door, one of several which connected the different parts of the house. Remember the bellman, James Bassett, reputedly one of the Ashton's first pauper apprentices. But the Ashtons needed adult as well as child workers. Shortly after they arrived in 1802, they put up several rows of back-to-back -back cottages very close to the Ramsbottom Mill. Mrs Edith Duckworth can remember these houses. She was born in number 39 back Ramsbottom Lane towards the end of this row. We lived in one up and down cottage. It was a dirt road, which it was. The sanitation was pretty good in at that time. Nine houses shared two cesspools and a midden, and they were up to 70 yards away from the front door. These substantial stone houses were probably very desirable in the early 1800s, but by the 1930s their back-to-back -back construction and lack of water or toilets led to their demolition. The 1833 Factory Act required employers to provide two hours a day of schooling for their child workers. We know that in 1841 the Ashtons put up a pair of cottages on Crow Lane for this purpose and we believe that this is where the child workers had their two hours of daily schooling. It may look like a normal detached house but until the late 1940s, 27 Crow Lane was a pair of one-up, one-down cottages. It had a communal front door and stone staircase, slightly wider than usual, probably because the house was built to double up as a school. Its flagstones would have been a great improvement on the earth floors of earlier Ramsottom houses. It's hard for us to appreciate that many families lived in far smaller houses than this. We know from census returns that there were scores of tiny, one-up, one-down houses in the town. Many survived well into the 1900s. Thomas Lord, a cotton worker like this man, lived here in 1842, and when his daughter married Robert Wollstoneholm, they moved in too. Presumably the family were at work when the children arrived for lessons. Robert was a cotton overlooker or foreman. His children and grandchildren were weavers and winders, but gradually the family broke their ties with the noisy weaving sheds. One chose an outdoor job associated with the new technology of the 19th century, gas. No one alive in Britain today can appreciate just how dark towns were at night. In the 1840s, there was just one street lamp in Ramsbottom, outside the Grant Arms. The Ramsbottom Gas Company opened its works at Stubbins in 1854. By 1901, Robert Wollstone Holmes' eldest grandson was a lamplighter, 
opening the gas jet of each street lamp at dusk and shutting it off again at dawn. Seven generations later, Wollstone descendants of Thomas Lord still live in the valley and having seen an article in the local paper by the Heritage Society, they got in touch. Gladys and Vera, great-great-granddaughters of Thomas Lord, used to stay with their aunt here and they have come back to the house for the first time since the 1940s. I don't remember. Because they have an oven in, in the old-fashioned fireplace, you know. Mm. And they probably did it in that. And on the fire. I know they used to put kettle on the fire. Did they? Mm. Yes, they had a thing that, a special thing, hadn't they, that, that turned, turned something in like and out. Oh, that, that type of thing. On it, it used to move, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it used, to, it used to move it round to put it over the heat, you know, over the coal. And then if, when it boiled, you turned it back again. If that was the bed, there would be three at the top and two at the bottom with the heads at the bottom. I don't remember being there. No. I don't remember at all. There's Auntie Rose, you, me, Hilda. Is that what have I got to for? Oh, uh, Walter. And um, my brother. This is where the toilet used to be, from what I can remember. The doors, the point of the toilet, along here. Yeah. There's a building, all the here. Oh, Not no. just the toilets, I think they were gold places. Could have been a shed and a window. Window there. The 1844 Factory Act put an end to the odd double roll of number 27. Half-time schooling became compulsory and the Ashtons put up a much larger building just up the lane. Known locally as the Athenaeum, this was the first proper school in Ramsbottom. Population growth soon outstripped the Athenaeum's humble facilities, and in 1868 the parish bought the building, extended it, and adopted the name St Paul's National Schools. By 1872, the school had room for 700 scholars. The school shut its doors for the last time in 2003, despite a vigorous local campaign to reverse Berry Council's closure plan. For the first time in the 162 years since the 1833 Factory Act first required those child cotton workers to spend two hours a day on the three R's, there is now no school on Crow Lane. At first, the school was used for church services, too. This was the first Church of England presence in the town. Before this, the nearest Anglican church was up the rake to Holcombe, and that's where Ramsbottom's dead were buried before 1850. But the Ashtons and Grants contributed to a public subscription to build St Paul's Church, opened in that year. Some of the stained glass in St Paul's commemorates these cash donations towards the building of both the school and the church. Here Christ blesses the little children in memory of Jane Grant, who had died in 1826 at the age of two. But it is this church, St Andrews, built by the Grants between 1832 and 1834, which is most closely associated with them. And because the Grants and many of their workers came from Scotland, yes, Ramsbottom's first big church was a Scottish Presbyterian church. It has a Scottish look about it, doesn't it? The Cheerable brothers are buried here. William, the elder one, paid for the church's construction, supposedly as a memorial to his parents, but I suspect he had an eye on creating a mausoleum suitable to his station. Just uh, look at his memorial. He's directly below in the vault with his brothers. He went to a lot of trouble in life preparing this last resting place. If you look carefully, you'll see the words London 1839 incised on this bust. He posed for this state-of-the-art likeness two years before he died. 
and there's a super clock here made by John Buchanan, the Grant's engineer at the Square Works. With a pendulum 29 and a half feet long, it's big enough for a cathedral. William Grant clearly did not want to sit in a cold church, so his wily Scots engineer, Buchanan, also installed a central heating system. Hot fumes were fed into the church from a brick tunnel which led under Church Field all the way from Square Works. There are even small grills in the centre of each St Andrew's cross up there. They could be opened and closed to adjust the church's ventilation. But St Andrew's is not Ramsottom's earliest church, nor the first in the area associated with the Grants. That distinction is held by Dundee Presbyterian Chapel, which stood in a remote spot up Dundee Lane from 1712 until it was demolished in 1978. Being Presbyterian, the chapel got a huge boost in numbers when the Grants and their workers came to Ramsbottom in the early 1800s. Unfortunately, the Grants fell out with the minister, Peter Ramsey, perhaps because he did not reciprocate the affections of one of their sisters. But he had also rattled their mother, Grace Mackenzie, by publicly criticising the family habit of spending Sunday afternoons entertaining guests at Grant Lodge, rather than repeating their morning attendance at the house of God. Fuddling and drinking, the Reverend Peter Ramsay called it. Let Hume Elliot relate how the family took its revenge. On the morning of Sunday, December the 11th, 1811, service in Dundee Chapel proceeded as usual until the text was announced. It happened to be taken from the first epistle of Peter. Immediately on its announcement, someone shouted, Nay, lad, it's the last epistle of Peter here. Whereupon a number of young fellows of the rougher sort, evidently acting in consort, proceeded to remove the minister. The leader of the group, the youngest of the Grants, with warlike spring kicked in the panel of the pulpit door. Mr. Ramsay was then excluded from the building. By more than one aged member of the congregation, we have been told, with awe of the fate, in after years, of most of those reckless and misguided men. As if pursued by an avenging providence, they came to mournful and untimely ends. One of them was crushed to death by the sudden fall of a block of stone in a neighbouring quarry. Another, under the influence of drink, fell in the street and was taken up dead. While the youthful leader, Daniel Grant, gifted with endowments which rightly wielded meant higher things, passed away in mournful circumstances some fourteen years after the expulsion. The Reverend Peter Ramsey was still preaching the gospel long after these youthful assailants had crumbled into dust. Hume Elliot's account tells us a lot about Ramsbottom's people 200 years ago. They were a rough and ready bunch, not as refined as today, but just remember how raw life was in that early industrial village. Houses were unimaginably basic, with no piped water and no sanitation. There were no shops, no proper roads, no schools, no churches, no doctors, no police no magistrates, no local council. It was like the Wild West, a frontier zone on the edge of civilization. No wonder it was a priority of the early manufacturers to build some churches and schools. But it depends on your politics whether you believe the Ashtons and the Grants wanted to civilize their workers or just control them. It was completely up to the mill owners to get some basic social and economic infrastructure in place. So we find them erecting houses, opening shops, promoting turnpike roads. Peel and Yates built this bridge around 1789 to improve access to the old ground. The Grant Estate charged tolls to users of the bridge from a toll bar there until 1900. And this photograph commemorates the freeing of the bridge in that year. So the early inhabitants of Ramsotton were very reliant on their employers and unfortunately this relationship was sometimes abused. 
I doubt if we would want to set foot in some of those cottages that the mill owners built for their workers, let alone live in them. This was Nuttall, once a thriving village with three mills and two thousand inhabitants, now all gone. The Grants owned the lot. According to a survey of 1838, the cottages had either one or two bedrooms, with an average of 6.5 people to a cottage. Twenty of the one-bedroom cottages had between 8 and 13 people living in them. The Grants ran the only shop in the village. We know all this from Mr Peter Murray McDowell, a Scottish physician who treated many of the Grants workers in Ramsbottom and Nuttall. McDowell's first-hand experience of living conditions amongst Ramsbottom's working classes caused him to become a leading member of the Chartist movement for parliamentary reform. He practised medicine here on Bolton Street until 1842. Apart from the year he spent in Chester Jail for sedition, where he met his wife, the daughter of one of his jailers. In 1842, McDowell went to London to give evidence to a parliamentary inquiry into the evils of truck, the payment of wages not in money but in food, goods or tickets, which could only be exchanged at the employer's shop. The truck system seems to have been prevalent in the Ramsottom area. Employers owned their workers' houses and ran the only shops in town so it made sense to settle accounts at the end of each pay period by deducting rent and shopping bills from wages. But this was open to abuse. To complain about leaking roofs, sand in the sugar or rotten bacon could mean the loss of your job, your house and you'd be blacklisted by all the other mill owners in the area. Needless to say not many workers dared give evidence to the 1842 inquiry into the truck system. But uniquely in Ramsbottom, MacDowell's income was independent of the mill owners and he could afford to spill the beans. Where do you reside? In Lancashire, in the neighbourhood of Bury, at the village Ramsbottom. Have you resided there any time? I have resided there since 1835. I believe you are a medical man. Yes. Have you many opportunities of mixing with the working classes? Yes, many opportunities at all seasons and all hours with all classes both rich and poor in that neighbourhood. Does the system of paying wages in goods prevail in the district where you live? Yes, in the majority of factories. At Ashton Factory it does not prevail. So there is a contrast of the systems afforded betwixt the one side of the valley and the other. McDowell went on to allege that the Grants operated a truck shop in Nuttall Village, that they evaded the law by running it through an agent, and that there was no other shop in this village of 2,000 people because the Grants owned all the property. Ramsbottom was not so affected by the truck system because the Ashtons paid cash wages and so there were lots of free shops which may be why there are so many shops in the town to this day. But McDowell alleged that the Grants insisted on paying their 100 dyers and block printers here on a Saturday night in their pub, the Grant Arms. That they forced them to take part of their wages in beer that they were given credit for beer from their next wage. And that they remained here until 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. Even the little boys who worked in the dye house were paid in this way and they came away drunk. We shouldn't be surprised that the inhabitants of 19th century Ramsbottom drank a bit. After the 1830 Beer House Act, anyone on payment of two guineas could throw open a room of his cottage and sell beer. Lots of Ramsottom's pubs started in this way, which is why so many look like terraced houses. By 1890, there were 28 pubs within 10 minutes stagger of marketplace. Most were beer houses, now usually shops, catering for men who did long, hot work. Drunkenness probably contributed to the roughness of early Ramsbottom. 
Even in the 1890s, the police still patrolled parts of the town in pairs. So here was this new industrial village, full of newcomers, a bit wild westish, with some wild inhabitants, like the Ashton workers from Middleton, a town renowned as a hotbed of radicalism. And those workhouse apprentices may have grown up into a bit of a handful. Quite a place. Communal disorder was a common way of expressing discontent in early industrial Lancashire. There were no civic avenues, no vote, and here in Ramsbottom, no elected board until 1864. The only policemen were unpaid township constables who served one year only. And so if tempers got flared, the military had to be called in. Industrial relations were especially fraught. Unions were illegal, so riot was the only alternative form of collective bargaining. In Haywood in 1808, one of the Ashton brothers was assaulted and beaten to the ground outside his own home by a group of handloom weavers disgruntled about the rates he was paying. But the invention of the power loom and the erection of weaving mills, like this one, middle mill, at Helm Shore created a new chronic downward pressure on the wages of Lancashire's handloom weavers. In April 1826, mobs of loom breakers swept along old tracks and across country to attack every weaving mill they could get at. A detachment of 20 riflemen, just forced march from Manchester, was at Ramsotton Mill in case it was attacked. They and 15 of the Queen's Bays were ordered to the mill at Chatterton, a mile up the valley. The local magistrate was William Grant, the elder Cheerable brother. He and the commanding officer, Colonel James Kearney, were determined to prevent the loom breakers spilling out of the Irwell Valley. If they got to the cotton towns around Manchester, support for them might turn into a popular uprising. By 11 o'clock on the morning of Wednesday the 26th April 1826, just 35 soldiers stood by the Chatterton Mill, facing a desperate mob of 4,000. William Grant read the Riot Act, but the mob set about the looms undeterred, throwing hails of stones at the soldiers. Despite five or 600 bullets being fired at them, the loom breakers continued their work for a full quarter of an hour. One officer wrote, The obstinacy and determination of the rioters was most extraordinary, and such as I could not have credited had I not witnessed it myself. Six rioters died, and an unknown number were wounded, although the carnage would have been far worse had the riflemen not fired some shots over the heads of the rioters. The inquests were held here at the Horse and Jockey in Edenfield. One fatality killed here was Ramsotton man James Watteker, a bystander whom the jury judged to have been murdered by one of the riflemen. He was buried at Holcombe Church four days later. The rifle regiment was swiftly sent abroad. Watteker's murderer never faced trial, although 41 of the Lancashire rioters of April 1826 were sentenced to death. Not one charge was brought against anyone involved in the Chatterton riot. It was as if the authorities did not want their conduct exposed to public scrutiny. Commutations meant that no one was executed but ten rioters, including two women, were transported to Australia for life. A further wave of strikes and riots swept through Lancashire in the summer of 1842. Ramsottom historian William Hume Elliot recorded in 1893 how the town could easily have been involved in violent unrest. Ramsbottom had amongst its people some ardent chartists. It is supposed that leaden bullets dug up some years ago at 72 Bolton Street had been concealed by one of these of the advanced type. 
Between the ceiling and the floor of an old house in Ramsbottom Lane, a pike head was found quite recently. There are supposedly more of the Chartists' lead bullets buried at Rosebank Stubbins. The 1840s was a harsh decade and Chartist agitation was at its height. These were called the Hungry Forties on account of high unemployment. Worse, the potato famine brought thousands of starving and impoverished Irish into the Lancashire Cotton Districts. They were deeply resented, not least because they would work for lower wages than the native Lancastrians. Interracial violence was especially common amongst the navvies on the new railway workings which were connecting up Lancashire's cotton districts. Soldiers were often summoned from Bolton Barracks to deal with navvies on the Manchester and Bolton Railway who were knocking down parish constables as if they were nine pins should these constables have been misguided enough to intervene. In May 1846, as the East Lancashire Railway was nearing completion, 2,000 navvies rioted here at Ramsbottom over wages paid to the English and the Irish. By the 1840s, as those navvies were digging the course of this railway alongside the Irwell, the skeleton of modern Ramsbottom was already in place. The original industrial village of Ramsbottom, based on the old ground, had been swept away in the 1820s, clearing the way for the cross-shaped template of the new town. But once the railway was opened in 1846, a new expansive phase began. Within 50 years, all the surrounding space was filled in with dozens of new streets, houses, shops, pubs and beer houses, mills, workshops, churches, schools and civic buildings. So an ageing Ramsotham resident alive in 1900 would scarcely have recognised the town of their childhood. Yet the town of today is not much changed since 1900. The older terraces have gone, along with many of the mills and the huge railway sidings by Ramsotham Mill. Since its earliest days as an industrial village, Ramsotham has always been remote from centres of economic and political power, and often left to its own devices. Being on the fringe of Greater Manchester, we escaped the worst that the planners and developers of the 1960s and 70s wreaked on our less fortunate neighbours. There's no feral concrete here. So that elderly resident of 1900 wouldn't find the modern town all that different. Well, apart from the odd intrusion. But there have been some big changes in the town's prosperity. By the 1970s, there was virtually nothing left of the textile industry. There was a sense of drabness and decline. The railway station was closed in 1972, and the last goods train ran in 1980. But then, Britain began to appreciate its heritage. On a brilliant summer's day in 1987, the new East Lancashire Railway ran its first steam train into Ramsbottom. The reopening of the line from Bury was celebrated in the town as fully as any new railway in the first railway ever. Since that day, visitors have flocked to Ramsbottom, and unlike some of our neighbours, we still had enough of our original buildings to adapt attractively to new uses. So craft shops, gift shops, eating places and a thriving theatre have sprung up. 
and the town has responded imaginatively to its new incarnation as a tourist attraction by putting on a wealth of events throughout the year. Ramsottom's name has always been something of a joke, but many locals who remember the old Ramsottom are especially amused that their once smoky, grimy mill town can attract tourists. In fact, the railway carries well over a hundred thousand people a year, and many of them get off at our new station to enjoy the friendly atmosphere and the pleasant moorland surroundings of the town. Lots of these visitors decide to move here, a new generation of incomers. So the arrival of the railway in 1987 closed one chapter of Ramsbottom's past and opened a new and expansive one in the town's story. Just as it did in 1846.